from Chennai and part of Tarot's uh, career. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, history of uh, test automation. Before getting into the talk, I uh, just want to know how many of you are curious. Okay. Maybe I ask. Uh, how many do test automation? Okay. I think almost the same as. Uh, so, how many do test automation uh, using other other than a uh, telling so what are the tools getting? Okay. Uh, USP, uh, code editing, uh, and disk computing. Okay. That's cool. There's a good collection of uh, mix of tools. So my talk here uh, is going to be mostly around uh, how the evaluation of this automation, where it started, how the market has reached, and uh, what does the UFT has done. Or the uh, memory tools, what memory tools are done? Uh, how come the rise of the uh, open source tools? Uh, and I'll slowly touch upon the current trends and, and going forward. So, our agenda is going to look like uh, something like this. So, uh, test automation, how it all started, uh, initial automation and techniques, uh, automation tools market, why cards. Uh, where is basically a commercial officer tools like uh, Rational, your disk company, all those, how come it flourished? And uh, what are the reasons for the race of open source tools? You see a lot of Selenium and a lot of other tools. And uh, what are other automation challenges other than the regular functional? Because most of the tools are here was functional automation. Okay, what are the other challenges? What are the other areas to actually go and automate? And uh, we'll currently look at current that way for. So test automation, how it all started. Uh, it started when testing actually started. Uh, so once the development was done, uh, what happened is uh, releases were happening. And testing were done by the developers themselves. And uh, we all know that uh, that's basically how the evaluation of test will happen. At some point, of what happened was uh, the testing time was taking more than the developer's time. So they were not able to release. So there was a huge time needed for release uh, testing or regression testing. Those kind of uh, time were actually taking a lot. So there were companies or uh, sort of product teams which were hiring more testers than the actual developers. So the efficiency of the testers decreased. Uh, the release time were actually taking a lot, lot of time. So then came the uh, problem of repeated tasks. So when uh, a tester is actually doing a repeated task of doing a regression testing or release testing. It is prone to be error, uh, as well as the fatigue factor actually affects them. Right? So they are not able to actually, uh, you know, the boredom or uh, the boredom actually comes to them. They are not actually able to look up the same screen. As you may have been testing uh, the same screen or same model for a couple of, of uh, days, actually uh, you tend to assume that I think uh, their own bucket may exist. I don't actually. I want to just keep. That's a natural human tendency when they actually start doing a repeated task. Uh, also, to improve accuracy, so when these fatigue happens, I think the accuracy or the test, that, uh, I mean, the test result that actually comes out of the testers, actually, the quality is very low. So, need to of, uh, improve accuracy was also there. And to increase test coverage, so how to test uh, uh, increase test coverage was, uh, so when you run uh, automation for a particular module or a set of test cases, you have uh, in your hand a lot of other time so that actually your actually existing test cases, you run your test automation. The other test actually you go, you go, you find new tests, you write new tests, you do an exploratory product of uh, understand that how, how the users actually interact with the product. You come out with new uh, testing scenarios. You get time to actually think through that, and your testing coverage increases. So, and there is one more portion like uh, there are few tests which we can't do ourselves, like so something like uh, low testing where you need 500 users or concurrent testing where 100 users are logging how your application behaves when. Thousand people are jamming a, a cinema booking site or a hotel accommodation site or a Christmas holiday booking offer sites or e commerce sites. Right? Those kind of scenarios, right? I mean, until you get into the production, you won't be able to actually get a feel of the real scenarios happening. So, I mean, when Flipkart launches comes with their uh, offer, I mean, I mean, the billion dollar sale or a, well, on that particular day, what happens is I think most of the service crashes, right? So, if at all you want to actually uh, to reproduce those kind of uh, simulate those kind of environments. I think that's not possible with manual testers. So that's where your need for automation actually increases. 
So here I'm going to touch upon how the initial automation and techniques look like. Uh, so when I say initial automation, right? Uh, so you only started with uh, people actually, I mean, testers actually writing small batch scripts, uh, small shell shell scripts, DOS prompt, so DOS scripts, those kind of things to make the repetitive jobs automated fashion. And slowly what happened is I think uh, uh, there, there, there was a need for a record and playback kind of a tool. So, so that's where uh, people first I'm doing a kind of a daily task or something. Let me record that somewhere. It could be in any form. Right? When I say record and playback, it's not, not daily the UI elements that I'm actually touching about. It could be even, uh, I'm getting into a, 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 a comment from the typing a, a syntax. I don't want to have that. I want to go to the history or do a short, short, uh, shortcut where I can actually reproduce the same effort and actually do a playback one number. So most of the initial automation were in the process of how we can record a, a manual sequence and how we can play it back. And the most of the data were static data sets. There weren't tools enough tools to actually uh, move your uh, data sets separately out of your scripts. So today, I mean, I mean, most of the, I mean, U of T or those things where you see, I mean, we we use a data-driven kind of approach where we move our uh, data to somewhere, Excel sheet database, say someone size, or what not, right? So, but the initial uh, automation with they were actually uh, test data were so much embedded in the scripts, and it was a static scripts. So, if at all they want to actually uh, do an another set of static tips, they need to go and edit it manually, or they need to record it and play back again. Uh, Low tool maturity. Uh, today, I mean, uh, we have got a very good, I think I would say we are in a very good environment where we can actually choose our tools and products, where we can have a plugin on top of it. We, yeah, we can actually, if not, uh, there is uh, any supporting library, we can write a supporting library. But those days, I think it was low tool maturity because it was not open enough, you can't actually uh, plug, plug and play. A lot of manual intervention. Uh, something like, I mean, I mean, there were few areas of uh, your same. Uh, manual step which could not be automated. So you need to actually, your human intervention is needed. So you can't actually run your script for 10 hours. Like, where it is a manual, a human uh, has to uh, come in and actually connect to a particular server or a network or a VPN, those kind of stuff. Were there. So manual intervention was there. Uh, no standard logging. Uh, so most of the tools, even I am sure, there's a of keys and other tools today, even like you can't actually plug into any of our log4j or something like that. I mean, you want to have your own logging, you can't actually use those lo logging tools integrated to it and, and make it uh, com comfortably. Uh, no parallel bar distributor. So, when the automation, uh, test automation actually started, it was only an ID or a, a single testing tool where you need to have all your scripts and just you need to play back or run the scripts. It runs on a single machine. Uh, very rarely, you had an agent concept where you can actually run on one agent, but even those cases, I think you need a license of uh, of that software where you are actually executing, running the software as well. So the, these are the limitations, or I would say, this is how actually initial automation started with all these constraints, uh, and it has slowly got mature. So what was happening, right? I think the software, I think the software field was like, uh, I mean, it's not like uh, in 2000 or in late day, 1990s only these test automation tools actually started. This starts the mission, if you actually look back, uh, even in 1980s, uh, there were uh, uh, test automation tools which started actually uh, happening in the market. So so if you actually, if you go back and look, right, it's almost like 20, 25 years today, uh, a test automation uh, by itself practice or uh, the, the tools or the market itself is a mature market, I would say, uh, where it has gone to a lot of transformation from uh, I mean, owned by bigger enterprises like your HPs, your likes of IBMs, your likes of uh, individual entrepreneurs, it has moved to a more open source world. But whereas if you look at uh, late 1980s, that's where actually the market actually picked up, uh, where the people felt there's a need for a commercial tool, right? So before that, most of the software is actually, were, uh, most of the test automation were, were not in a, uh, I would say, uh, uh, as a tool format or a commercial tool level where everybody can actually do such a tool. Uh, uh, so each and every company or each and every software department or a product, they have their own uh, set of record and playback scripts which will actually do a user simulation. That's what uh, they do, they run before uh, going for a release. But in 1985, everything changed, I would say. Uh, Autotester was uh, the first uh, 
uh, commercial test tool uh, for PC. Uh, it was basically for, I mean, I mean, it was 1985, so naturally it was MS-DOS uh, world. So, so on the desktop was our first commercial tool. Uh, then in 1980, uh, late 1980s, uh, Silk software. Uh, how many of you know Silk test? Heard of Silk test? Okay. Okay. Uh, so a, a tool called Silk test uh, evolved. Uh, so actually, it was developed by Seed Software uh, in 1988. Uh, that was the first release for them. Then, uh, if you go and see Seed, I don't think uh, you will be able to find that name uh, because Seed sold the Silk test to uh, Silk test software to Borland, and then Borland it micro focus. Oh. So, so 1980s, uh, 90s, 95s, 2000s were actually ruled by Silk test. I would say uh, because uh, there are a lot of advantage of uh, uh, Silk test. They're supporting a language called Fortis language, uh, which is like uh, C, a little bit of improved C, I would say, a uh, little bit of object supporting for, a little bit of C++ with object supports. But all these tools, if you actually look at, they were customized uh, by their own company because they felt that the testers are not in a mature state where they can actually go and write your own C++ program or Java programs or something like that. So they, what they made is they customized a software on top of all those libraries to make it look like a little bit of a newer language is that's called four test language. All those I mean scripting languages are for a particular tool evolved. And in 1989 it was a load runner from the Mercury Interactive. Uh, Mercury was uh, bought by HP at some point of time. Uh, that's when uh, QDP was very popular. It became uh, Mercury tool was bought by uh, HP. Uh, so, and the Mercury Interactive launched a Windrunner in 1995. Uh, so, Windrunner, I would say, is a father of QDP. Uh, the reason being, uh, Windrunner was, uh, Windrunner and QDP exist in the same uh, era, uh, where uh, QDP was actually taking over the market, and actually, in fact, was stealing the Windrunner's mind. Windrunner uh, was, I would say, Windrunner was one of the finest uh, uh, test automation tool in 2000s. Uh, uh, where it was able to automate both your uh, client server applications and web based applications. Uh, and it was supporting a language called uh, uh, C like scripting. They add their own scripting language, uh, uh, language is called a script language. Uh, it is mostly like a C syntax with no object supports. So you need to write scripts, a lot of scripts. You can write an editor files or something like that, which you can. HP product, it's almost like 25, 27 years old product that you're actually working sitting on. <coughs> so, quick test actually, uh, quick test professional, when Mercury had, they felt that the C like syntax, uh, it was uh, uh, a bit outdated. They were not able to actually, uh, it was in fact commercially uh, not viable for them uh, to actually write plugins for newly third party supported uh, libraries like .NET or Java or your know, DevX controls or infrastructures, any rich interface, I mean client interface. So your Flash or those kind of things, uh, they were struggling to, to support using WinRunner because they need to write the uh, C libraries. So what they planned is they came out with a quick test professional which, uh, with the uh, .NET support uh, and uh, which was written in VBScript, which was actually connected to VBScript by in fact call other DLS or something like that to do another operations. So quick test uh, professional, was a big hit in the market. That's when uh, uh, HP actually uh, took over uh, both with this and killed the Windrunner. Uh, automated QA launched a test complete in 2000. So somebody raised the ads, right? So it was initially test complete was for automated QA and then it was merged with Smart Beer. Uh, and they know that is Smart Beer, SQA complete, and other tools set of tools. Uh, 
So in this, if you actually look at right, so the the all of the commercial uh, tool market was happening in 1985 to here uh, end of 2000s or it or I would say it extended to a few places until 2005 because those enterprises which have bought a 10 year license or five year licenses signed at 2000 or the initial 2005s are still using it in 2010s and 2012s. So that's how that's how we actually look like and uh, Selenium developed I thought was 2004 yes. and. Uh, <clears throat> and it has stayed. I mean, I mean, recently we actually last year uh, we actually celebrated ten years of uh, uh, selenium. Uh, <coughs> so there are other tools like Rational, RanoX, Computer, OpenSDA, White, and Auto ID, and there are the list is actually huge. But uh, we are actually trying to understand here how from 1985 uh, most of the tools. So I am not actually going to train all those other tools actually that came after 2004, which are more open source. Which is more popular with you guys. Uh, Rational Robo. So Rational uh, was one of the software company. Uh, uh, you know, the founder was some, some someone called Delvin, who was an entrepreneur, who was actually having this Rational software. Uh, he sold to IBM. Uh, 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 IBM at a very mature state when the Rational had different uh, product suits to it. Uh, Rational had a Rational Robo, uh, Rational Rose, Rational Clear Case. It's a suit of product which actually IBM took over. So if you actually see the right, I think I think when uh, these players actually uh, were, I mean, C was there, Mercury was there, Automated Gear was there, Rational was there. They were actually pioneers in actually this kind of commercial tool and slowly moved to the enterprises level. People actually and the old uh, testing tool itself took a, a different transformation uh, with the cost increase. So Rational Robo become your uh, uh, Rational Functional Tester uh, uh, or IBM's uh, uh, Functional Tester. So. And uh, Compuware uh, uh, is a UK based company uh, which has a product called Test Partner. Uh, Ranorex is another tool, OpenSTA, it came around 2005. Uh, there was white for uh, something like a Selenium, where uh, you can automate uh, web, white, you can automate uh, desktop applications, and Auto IT, uh, it's another open source. So, you look at why uh, commercial of the uh, self tools flourished, right? I think. Uh, uh, we are not able to actually, I mean, even though these things actually came almost like 85, you now we are in 2015, almost like 15, 20, 30 years, still I think uh, we have an effect, I would say, on those tools because, because th those were actually record and playback, right? Those commercial officers actually gave you a record and playback option, even though it was very flakiness, I mean, you can't uh, trust it. No ways are non tech users or business users felt, I think I'm able to simulate something, right? I, I in a, Within a minute, Within a five minutes span, actually, I'm able to run my record my whole business scenario and I'm able to run it back. So they, they felt, I think, they felt very comfortable. Uh, and object identification repository. So these people actually uh, came out with a nice set of tools like uh, your, uh, uh, QDP, you call guys by uh, those kind of an object repositories where you can actually identify an object and actually uh, store it as well so that it could be used for uh, automation. So those things actually, like before these commercial of the tools, the testers were not actually comfortable in actually getting understanding how the uh, code look like, or what's what's inside the, or what's inside a uh, text box, or what is a, what is it called a property. They were not much comfortable because they never have seen. But these guy space and these kind of object repositories gave a little exposure to them of insights of what the forms they were filling up and the workflows they were actually making. So it actually it helped them. They were able to interact more. They felt that as a, there is a connect between those kind of tools uh, with the application they actually test day in day out. Uh, third party tool support. So when I say third party tool support, uh, it's mostly about your rich internet applications. Right? So uh, in the uh, late 1990s or, or, or even mid of 2000s, I think you have uh, many rich internet applications. Right? Your Flash was there. Your Flex was there. Uh, and your silver egg component for Microsoft was there. So all these components, what we are doing is they were able to, the same web UI, if you look in 2000s or in late 2000, or 2000, that's a huge transformation, right? We were able to say kind of web 2.0, kind of the UI rich JavaScript, rich HTML, CSS actually playing around. So all those things were able to come out with uh, third party tools which developers were actually using. 
but uh, these commercial uh, 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 I mean, off the shelf uh, providers actually made a tie up with them or uh, they were able to allocate specific engineers to work on, on these products and come out with a plug in play model for them. So, so that's where uh, QAPT starts supporting Flare, Flare Fix, and your other tools, uh, you know, Flex and Infra GST components, other components, uh, we were able to actually directly support. And uh, out of box support with this management tool, uh, Q, QDP are uh, integration with uh, QC. Uh, so, so there are, I think they are able to come out with a think about a plugin model where uh, you can actually move your uh, QDP to any uh, any standard test management tool or a defect management tool. You can actually come out with the plugins. Uh, Built-in schedulers. Uh, so even scheduling, I mean, you never had CI in those days where you can actually schedule continuously integrating builds on after that. So testers, what they felt is, I mean, these commercial tools actually built in schedulers for them so that they can actually run them, I mean, that they can actually put a timing on it and you know, run at a particular point of time. And uh, it supported both thick line and thin line, even selenium, right? I think it doesn't support uh, thick line. So there were, in uh, early 2000s, where client server applications still existed, even, to, even today it exists. <coughs> But there are more numbers uh, in 2000, early 2000. So, so at that at the point of time, if you look back, they felt I think a one tool from a commercial uh, uh, will actually solve both of my purpose. And they are inbuilt exception handling and recovery scenarios. Uh, you can actually uh, rather than you writing a govern customized uh, build, I mean uh, uh, test execution report actually uh, uh, they provided their own test execution reports. And uh, Rise of open source tools. Uh, so, even though I think, uh, uh, I mean, even though we can say I think it was all uh, evil and devil for the commercial of the of the self tools to actually uh, to think, I mean, make only 15 to 20 years market uh, with all those uh, commercial products, but it, it laid a very good layout of what actually uh, it actually uh, took. Uh, uh, the testers close to an automation tool, right? I mean, today if you want to actually connect to a test automation tool, people are able to quickly connect to a PDP or something like that. Reason because of all those advantages came out, and and slowly they have started seeing advantages in uh, Selenium or these kind of open source tools because of the language support. You can actually uh, write scripts in Java uh, in, in .NET. Initially, it was uh, I mean you are actually writing in a little. Uh, uh, something like a TSL or a Fortis language, which was customized for um, customized version. But uh, this language support actually gave a, uh, a more open world to us, right? Where you can actually write your own objects, uh, programming uh, support directly to Java and .NET, uh, Ruby, and other other direct support, basically. And it has a lot of flexibility and it's more customizable. Uh, integration with build tools, uh, cost, I mean, no absolute cost, uh, low risk. Uh, access to every, everyone, and uh, also it has got uh, vibrant uh, community support. So there, there are many tools. Uh, we will uh, uh, example like uh, JMeter, which is there for almost like 25 years. Uh, your Gatling, your Scala Test, your Cucumber, any, any open source tools. You see, I mean, all these. Uh, that's the reason for actually. These are the reason for all these uh, tools to exist in this market for this long time. Uh, I will touch upon other automation challenges, right? So, so, so when we are talking about all this test automation, it was predominantly mostly functional, and there were uh, so once you have most of the functional uh, problems are solved either by the commercial tool or by the open source tool, uh, people have started looking at uh, other yeah, other challenges like uh, how we can actually do a performance test, how we can do a, a UI test, uh, how you can do mobile test. So there were so that's when actually uh, our startup um, in focus changed towards other automation tools for, for different aspects like performance, uh, load runner, your JMeter, your Gatling, uh, service test. So, uh, so initially everybody knows it was a two-tier architecture, then a three-tier architecture came where you have a middle tier or your service layer. So tests have been uh, just started at different levels basically. Uh, one is at your UI test separately, your service uh, test and your database test. So that's when the service testing become popular. SOAP UI. Uh, initially, SOAP UI is open source. Then it actually, uh, I think the one version still remains open source. Another being is the tied up with the automated UI or the smart UI. And there's a Postman, uh, a rest, a rest, so there are multiple tools. Uh, 
the germatic ui testing uh, where uh, uh, you can actually fake your uh, i mean i mean the ui your ui need not eat the uh, your servers to actually to to get your database back where you can actually uh, uh, fake it and actually put the uh, uh, data uh, to test your ui separately Oh, yes, was one nice tool. There are mobile testing, CTES, Ubuntu, Appium, Calabash. So, so all these uh, other challenges, right, like performance, service, or your thermatic UI for mobile testing, these tools evolve to actually solve different problems at different point of time. So, current and going forward. So, if you actually look at uh, data space. Your Twitter space, or your analytical space, or your ETL space, or your visualization. So now, what happens is your ETL jobs are run separately. Uh, your data is analytical models are running somewhere, and your visualization is happening at a different layer. So there are three teams of, uh, I mean, I mean, three different teams working on three different things, and they integrate, and you need to test. So how do you test with big data? Uh, there are a few tools, but not much mature uh, tools. Uh, for an ETL testing, there's an ICDQ, uh, of Q, and uh, for if you look, look at each and every, there is a big data uh, whole thing happening, your Spark thing for that orchestration, how do you actually go and solve those kind of uh, uh, challenges is what actually the current need. Uh, and uh, Google is working a lot on web components and uh, polymers, those kind of tools for visualization, how you can actually uh, automate those kind of uh, rich UI uh, new components that's coming in. Uh, one way it could be uh, using your open source like your Sipuli or your uh, other visualization tools you can go and solve. It's on distributed about cloud testing. So most of the commercial, uh, even though we have been running, we have been using multiple agents to actually perform tests and execute tests. Uh, still, I, I feel I think that there's a lot of more space in the distributed and cloud uh, testing that needs to be used. Uh, uh, if not for uh, if if the infrastructure actually is a constraint or expertise to run is a constraint, there are open source. I mean, there are commercial tools like uh, Source Labs or a Blitz to do your distributed work cloud testing. Multiple devices based sync testing. So how do you sync today? Uh, people use multiple uh, uh, pr product or an app in multiple. Like, you have your web client, your client, your mobile app. Everything is there. So how do you actually do sync testing on all these things? Are there any automation tools? Uh, model based testing. So rather than actually uh, writing test automation for your software code, can we actually generate uh, test from, from the models itself? So there are uh, there are research happening in uh, there, and there are a few uh, tools like Guide Tar, uh, Py Model, and Graph Walker, which actually gives you uh, all the combination of uh, test cases that can be automated or test against these kind of models. Uh, Property-based testing. Uh, more infrastructure automation. Uh, when I say more infrastructure automation, uh, it's like uh, today we we are actually solving all the functionality uh, uh, problems, like uh, from the tests, basically automating into that. What happens to your infrastructure structure basically? Well, who sets your environment, right? So uh, today we have, uh, a, I mean, auto deployments, those stuff are taking care, but uh, that's mostly for the production level or for the deployment purpose, purpose. but are we as testers already there to where you can use the uh, AWS, uh, Terraform, or a Docker to actually run our test? So basically, you write your test, you build your own Docker container, and you run your test in AWS. So there is no need for anybody to dependency. I mean, I mean, you, you set up your own product. I mean, test test box. Each and every one have your own uh, Docker instance set up to run and actually point your uh, and running. So those are uh, the, the more immediate look at other infrastructure automation. That brings. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So you're asking what is Docker? Okay. okay. How we can actually uh, serve our own? Uh, so you make uh, the test independent of any 
have a different uh, uh, dependencies. For example, if you want ruby or if you want uh, selenium along with ruby, uh, so you can put that in a container. Okay, build an image, build up the container, and run test from there. So it will not depend on any other machine which has uh, either ruby or selenium installed. So if this can be run on any uh, machine which has just, just the Docker setup. You need not depend on any other environment. The container or the image is contain both. The, uh, it would contain all the dependencies which are required for this. Okay, go into the dependencies. Yes, you can use the same image, bring up the container in whichever server or whichever agent you want it, and then run the test from there. It's more about the virtualization. Uh, so assume uh, you want to uh, assume there are four different uh, uh, systems running in your application. Uh, one is running in Apache, uh, and another is running a different uh, different application server. And each and every all these four systems are different, differently running. Uh, you want to test that. What you are doing is actually creating a Docker container for each and every system in your local machine, where you can actually communicate and work on. So uh, these local machines can be brought up into these scripts whenever needed. That's a Terraform. There are Terraform scripts which can actually on top of Docker, which actually build comes uh, with, with takes your system of four different systems can be in your own I mean, Mac box or Windows box or those kind of things. You can actually bring, bring all those and you can actually test that for you. As if you are doing here, testing in a four system environment. In uh, have you heard of VMs testing on VMs? Which one is yes? Yes. Yes. Similar to that. It's similar to that, yeah. to that but this has more advantage in the sense you may not allocate any resource as such. For example, in case of VMs, you would be allocating a reasonable amount of memory, but Docker is not that case. So you have this image wherein you build what are the dependencies, what are the requirements for the tests you have to run, and they would be built and run whenever it is needed. So if you want to run the test, you bring up the container and run. It will use the resources only when needed. Okay, but in case of VM, it is not the other. Way. You would allocate the resources for um, the tests as such. You so if, when the tests are not run, the resources are idle. You can avoid this in Docker. One more thing is software as a code uh, concept is more involved, tied up with Docker. Uh, when I say that, I think uh, for uh, uh, one of our production machines, you want a, a particular uh, Unix instance. With a particular database installed, with particular uh, Jemo server or something like installed, other dependency software installed, all those things could be a part of your script. So you run the script, or this, the scripts run as part of your Docker, and your image is ready in the local machine. Yes, you can copy it. You need not make a copy, you have to put that in the Docker file. So, Docker file would contain what are the uh, dependencies or what are the requirements for the test. For example, if you, uh, if you have some other uh, library or any plugin that you want to install in the, uh, in the image or in the container, you would add that in the Docker file. So, once you build that, it will bring up or build the image with the newly added uh, library. So, yeah, now your Docker image is ready. And now you have to build the image. You need not copy, you just you have to just add and put it there. Okay, because you have a script, uh, Docker file for that, you actually run this Docker file anywhere you get the content. Consider a simple example. See, you cannot have IE8 and see, you want to test in IE8, 9, and 10, and 11. You cannot have a different multiple versions of IE in the same machine. Right? So, you can, when you dockerize your testing environment, one unit one you need, say, you need Java, Selenium, and IE for, it, for you to run your system. So, if you have one container, with Java setting in IE, have another uh, another Docker image with IE uh, Java IE nine the same. So when you want to run your tests in IE eight, you just spin up that container. And when you want other time, when only when you're running the test, the container will be active. Rest of the time, it doesn't consume any space. So in a single machine, single testing environment, you'll be able to have these many versions. Otherwise, you need to have a single machine for IE nine, single machine for IE eight. So this solves this problem. So you need not you will have browser stacks and other things for them, but they are extremely costly. So with a single machine, say you have a Mac or Linux book, you can have these many number of OS procedures. And the continuous way when you when you have the test. Thank you. So now we have the
so I think uh, people are distributing uh, stickies. So please write the feedback for the session uh, and uh, for the speaker. Thank <laughs> you. 